Good evening. It has been my honor and privilege for the past 11 years to serve as your Member of Parliament for Brantford Brant. We have seen the accomplishment of many things, among them superb university facilities, a multi-million dollar water treatment plant at Six Nations, excellent day-by-day -day constituency service by our helpful and caring staff, everything from expediting passports and helping you shred unwanted documents. I am seeking your support to continue in your service here in our hometown. I truly believe we are on the cusp of change in Ottawa. Change is in the air, change that will see Canadians elect Andrew Scheer as Prime Minister with his program to bring financial help at last to hardworking Canadians. To help you get ahead, change that will defeat the arrogant and wasteful regime of Justin Trudeau that is loading up debt that will fall hard on our children and grandchildren for generations to come. As business people here in Brantford Brant, and as parents to four children, my wife Nancy and I always faced a certain reality. Business budgets and family budgets have to be balanced. You can dodge that reality, but the credit card comes due. Ignoring rising debt levels leads to disaster. The same truth applies even more so to government. Andrew Scheer will end careless and wasteful liberal deficit spending and bring the federal budget under control immediately and into balance in five years. I'm excited and energized at the prospect of serving you in a refreshed new government that will be keen on making your personal financial situation better, helping you get ahead. Next, Bob Jonkman. The Green Party has three priorities in this upcoming election. The climate crisis, obviously the Greens, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and proportional representation. Everything in the Green Party platform is tied to the United Nations uh, social development goals, which includes things like um, clean water, no poverty, no hunger, uh, decent work, and climate action as well. But nobody's going to be interested in dealing with climate change or uh, electoral reform if people are, are poor or hungry or homeless. And so the Green Party also has a solid platform of social programs, things like guaranteed livable income, a national housing strategy, universal pharmacare. Um, these are programs that will cost some money. People have called this program effective and realistic but unfeasible. But the people who say that are the people who have a vested interest in maintaining things the way that they are. This is the 1%, the ultra-wealthy, the people who control 50% of all the wealth in, in Canada. These are the people who want to keep things as they are. The Green Party has a plan to address that disparity of wealth by uh, overhauling the, the existing tax system looking at taxing banking transactions, and that's worth some $15 billion, increasing the corporate uh, tax for large corporations, it's another $15 billion, tax rate, and, and tax loopholes. Uh, the offshore banking that's taking place is, is a huge tax uh, sink for, uh, for Canadians. It's another $15 billion there. You know, $15 billion here it adds up after a while. <laughs> when the Green Party is going to implement these programs, it will be a significant change in how the government works. It's not like the previous governments uh, have been doing it in the past. So if you are looking Stop. to do something different... Stop. Thank you. Thank you. Last thing, Laurie. Thank you very much. I believe in the golden rule of public representation. To me, that means that I'm going to try and represent you the way that I'd like to be represented. Uh, the first thing I'd do is i if I was a homeless person, the first thing I'd want my representative to do was to get me off the street. And if that means deporting people and giving them their homes, 
I do that very thing to take Canadians and put them under house, under roof. And then I put food in their stomachs. I put Canadians first before you immigrants. We've got a refugee crisis here right now, and we need to deal with that. It's cold. I got up this morning, it was already cold. If you're on the street, then you'd be cold this morning. It isn't very good. And if I was a veteran, I'd want Canadians to put me first. And that way, I wouldn't have to go without health care. Instead of watching people come into our country and getting free health care while I serve my nation and I can't get health care. Now, I'm not a veteran, but this, I'm just putting myself in the place of veterans. And that's what we should do, empathize with the people that need our help. And if I was uh, thrown in jail because I said something that some Jewish groups didn't like, that I'd want my representative to stand up to the lampshade mafia and tell them, this is Canada, this is not Jewish Israel, this is the Israeli state. Miss, Miss, please. Mr. Mori, please keep your comments general. Oh, it is. And then I'd like to just well, make sure yeah, that we have please. free speech. Excuse me? Excuse me? If you're allowing that, I'm leaving. Yeah. No. Anyway, so anyway. You're not allowing that. You're not allowing that. You can't, I'm sorry, but that's inappropriate. I'm going to continue with a different string. We're done with that line. Well, so basically, it shouldn't have been there. I apologize. I, I'd like to uh, oh, also oh, have my representative. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. Apologize. We don't want this to fall apart. So please. Thank you. Okay. The next thing I'd like to do, or I'd have my representative do for me, is nationalize banking so that we can have all the social programs that we can, we'd we like to have and have the civil service earn them into existence the way that happened before in the past. And I won't name the country because I see a lot of sensitive people here yes. who might not want to know the truth about what happened, so I'm not going to no, delve into that. Please, Mr. Gorey, these are inappropriate comments and we will not allow it. I'm talking about finance now. But you're making... No. Thank you. Mr. Chamel. Well, when I mention a web page, it's at my site, smartestmanonearth.ca or smartestman.ca for short. Now, how dare I say that? Well, I got the closest education to Mr. Spock on the planet, engineering, and how to find the winningest way to go with math, gambling, theory. So that's why I took out those sites. Now, I wrote a little poem about our problem. Canada's debt national had much stability till 1974 starts exponentiality. Same in Ontario, Quebec. Debt's doubling over time. Did debts all start to grow in big coincidence? So why? The Bank of Canada once loaned to provinces and fed without the interest that causes budgets to turn red. With only taxes for depreciation and repair, so easily affordable without the banker's share. But in 1974, Pierre Trudeau cut the fee, said no more interest-free loans for infrastructure need. All governments must borrow now new funds from private banks and raise new tax to pay new interest with bankers' thanks. But worse, in 1968, Pierre Trudeau lifted cap on interest from 6% to 60, that's the wrap. In 12 years, central bank rate rose to 22%. Remember that, gray hairs? Uh, more tax to pay more higher rates, more tax to pay a greater debt at higher rates was spent. So, Mr. Spock, at Computer Central all along, could keep up bad code to save the planet from the danger zone. What Spock could do, no, no help he needed from the low-tech slopes who had no clue. But Spock can do, the engineer says, I can do it too. What can I do? The Spock move. I can reprogram the Bank of Canada with this Two famous left software. Two to get thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chamel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Danielle Takis. Thank you. I'm going to stand and stay here for the duration of the two hours because I am going to hear what's going to be said and I'm going to stand up to it and I'm going to offer an alternative and I think you should be standing up to what you, you hear 
And if you disagree with it, you should say so, and you should be offering su alternative suggestions, positively what's going to be offered. So I'm running for the second time as a Liberal MP because I believe the Liberal government over the last four years has done an incredible job to bring prosperity. The evidence is that we have kept 92% of our commitments, and that was um, done by a recent uh, journal that was non-affiliated with us that did those um, numbers for us. We are an economy that is thriving with one million new jobs, 900,000 people lifted out of poverty, and the lowest unemployment rate in 40 years. We need an MP who reflects what our community is becoming, fresh and energetic. I'm going to do everything that I can in Ottawa or elsewhere to encourage federal investment and business startups and brand for brand create good paying jobs. But most importantly, we cannot allow Doug Ford and Andrew Scheer to team up and attack social programs in vulnerable communities. On Friday, while many were at advanced polls, the Conservatives disclosed they were proposing $53 billion in cuts, but no Conservative will tell you what they're going to cut, how many jobs will be lost, and who will suffer just like Doug Ford did last year. I can say in all honesty, this is a very close two-way race, and I'm the only progressive candidate who can beat my conservative opponent, who admittedly I like and is a very nice guy, but it is time we have an MP who represents the values of everyone at Brantford Brant. I won't quit till the job is done, and that's why I'm here. I came up short just four years ago because the progressive vote was split, so I'm asking all progressives to get behind me this time as your MP, I will make sure problems get solved and stay solved. No excuses, just results. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you to the organizers and everyone that has come to share in this discussion this evening. I too am going to stay because part of the reason why I'm running is because of the divisive politics that exist in our everyday rhetoric and it's becoming more common, these conversations, that they are being allowed. And unfortunately, this is all we're hearing every day, whether it's this side of the border or the other, we have our own backyard to clean up as well. I'm running in this riding because we are ready for actual change here in Brantford Brant. I'm in this riding, I work every day, I raise my children, I'm involved in the community, and I know the needs that are here. And like my colleague, absolutely, we are ready for a leader that represents all, and not in a false way. Someone that is ready to stand up for all of our rights, someone that is willing to challenge the status quo. In our riding alone, we have 10,000 residents that do not have access to clean drinking water. That day needs to end. It is 2019, and when are we going to address that? I spend my days sharing that information. It is time that we have action on the environmental racism that actually happens in our ridings. And I am the candidate that is about to bring that change that represents all of our constituents when we're looking at our LGBTQ trans non-binary, when we're looking at our women, when we're looking at our men, when we're looking at our children and our most marginalized community. I am that representative and I absolutely can take care of Grant for Grant. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, for 150 years, Canadians have played ping pong identity politics. Even in the 60s, with the incoming of the New Democratic Party, we still continue to play identity politics. We like the Liberals, we elect the Liberals, we despise the Liberals, we elect the Conservatives, we despise the Conservatives, and we continue on this cycle and have done so for that period of time. But something is happening. Something is clearly happening. Because for the first time in Canadian history, we have more candidates with parties and independent representation than at any other time in Canadian history. Two times the sum of the NDP, Conservative, and Liberal candidates. That's a huge statement on its own. We have a new party that has done what no other party has been able to do in Canadian political history. 312 confirmed candidates by the People's Party of Canada. Our leader, Maxime Bernier, brings a skill set of law, economics, banking, statesmanship-like presentation. And if you watch the debates, watch carefully, because this is where I want to take my message here this evening. This is not about the Liberals 
or the conservatives. This should not be about NDPs or Greens. This shouldn't be about the left or the right. In fact, I'm not politically left. I'm not politically right, and I will not be politically correct. I am a Canadian, ladies and gentlemen, and like you, a Canadian for life. I ask you to look at the policies and be a practical voter, not a traditional voter or a <clears throat> tactical voter. Compare the policies. Look at what is having to be offered. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dave Robel. I am the candidate for the People's Party of Canada. I will be here right after this event to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to fly off script a little bit, as I tend to do back in my entertainment days. But I want to tell the gentleman at the end that I agree with Phil McCollman. There is no reason for that type of rhetoric garbage to be spoken at a procedure like this. It has been for decades that all the major parties here in Canada have convinced all of us that there is no room for one more party, a small party, to do something brand new. It's always been told that way. We've almost been bred and convinced that voting for a small party is a wasted vote or a waste of time. I'm no stranger to miracles. I'm no stranger to doing the impossible. The Veterans Coalition Party of Canada truly believes that we should be spending our time and money focused on those within our own borders. Any race, any color, we are all Canadian, we are all one family, and it needs to be treated that way. Come October 21st, Brantford Brand and all of Canada finally has a true alternative to the big three parties. My name is Jeff Gallagher from the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada, and we still stand on guard for the... Next, we'll start with the first question that you were received ahead of time, and it's two minutes per candidate. The, the question is, what are your party's plans for providing affordable housing for all Canadians from homeless youth through to struggling seniors? On the weekend, I had the chance to speak to one of our constituents, Sue, and she's 66 and she's really worried about her retirement and she started talking to me about the affordability and she's bringing in seventeen hundred dollars a month but her rent is over eight hundred dollars and one of the things that the ndp are committed to is bringing in five hundred thousand new affordable housing units not only that but a rental subsidy for those that are paying more than 30% of their housing from their income, they're going to receive a $5,000 subsidy. And that's huge, especially when we're looking at our youth and our seniors on limited budgets and access. We want to make sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable. Our families, as well, need access to housing. And this is one of our prime concerns. Next is John Turmel, Independent. So we always come back to the affordability. Now, what would it cost for, to pay for a condo if you were just paying for the depreciation and not the interest? Not so bad, right? Hundred bucks, 200 bucks a month instead of 800, 1,000? Now, imagine that the Bank of Canada worked like a casino. And as fast as construction built new houses, we gave them new chips. Then they put the houses on sale for the number of chips we paid the guys to build them. And if you come and sign up for one of those houses, we expect you to cover the depreciation, right? But if it's financed at the Bank of Canada, you don't have to throw in the extra six bucks in interest every month for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, it always comes back to usury, the greatest sin in the Bible. The reason Jesus beat up the bankers in the temple, the loan sharks. He didn't beat up the hookers, the thieves, the prostitutes. He beat up the loan sharks. I thought I had two minutes. Yeah, just be careful. <laughs> you got a problem with my using the Bible? <laughs> okay. St. Jesus said, if you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Muhammad said, if you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Is that better now? Islam and Christianity. And all Judaism. Me and I, let the exacting of interest stop. 
So excuse me for quoting Jesus at a political meeting when he makes my point. You suckers are being drained okay. by debt service, Mr. Jamal, and that's Jesus enough. had a way of fixing it. Right. Hey, I'm listening to her, okay? Stop interrupting me. I was not in the temple until my time expires as why we had to get rid of this illusory. If I upset you, you're the most fluoridated city in the world. No wonder you're low IQ. I was in Hamilton. I wasn't low IQ in my okay. youth. So, your time is up. If you have trouble, stay up. Time's up. Time's up. Yeah. Mr. Jamel, thank you. <laughs> no, it's not you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition Party, please. <laughs> I was told there was no alcohol at these events. What is going on? The question of affordable housing is, is an incredibly uh, touchy subject because in today's push-button instant gratification society, the answer to this is going to be a long-term one. And we don't have a phone app to make this problem go away. The long-term plan that the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada wants to put in place immediately is to build homes right away for seniors and veterans that need the most help with affordable housing. Over time and over building infrastructure with new business, with cleaning up the downtown area of the drugs and crime. That is how we build to help out the younger folks with the family, two kids, whatever the case may be. But it must start with our seniors and veterans first. They've already given so much to our country and, and to their families. This is the only way it can be done, is by starting with them and then building down to the younger people that also need the help. It is not going to be a popular solution. It's a long-term one, but it's an honest solution. And that's how I believe it needs to be approached. Right on. Thank you. Bob Johnson, Green Party. Thank you. When I've been knocking on doors and mentioned the national housing strategy that the Green Party has planned, that resonates with more people in Brantford than I would ever have imagined. The uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the top two out of three are no poverty and good health and well-being, and list housing as a fundamental human right. Housing needs are addressed throughout the Green Party platform uh, using a housing-first approach. Um, it's a place where people can get back on their feet, uh, uh, heal from sickness and, and be protected, and, and to look for work. The, the value of a hot shower before going out for a job interview is, is vastly underappreciated by those people who haven't had to do it out. There's a national housing strategy at the moment, but the Green Party's housing strategy would implement housing first immediately, not 15 years from now. We want to have a, uh, a housing strategy in cooperation with the provinces, because housing really is a provincial jurisdiction. So the Green Party has the plans to set up a council of Canadian uh, governments, which includes municipalities, provincial governments, territories, uh, and the indigenous First Nations, um, um, Inuit and Métis. And all of these groups together can work out a national housing strategy that matches what the different municipalities need. And <coughs> make sure that housing is equally accessible across the entire country to all Canadians. In addition, there's a guaranteed livable income in our uh, platform, which would ensure that every Canadian has enough money to live on, which would include buying food, buying housing, and not having to make the decision between the two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Tyson, Green Party. A few years ago, The Expositor had a very insightful article about the need for affordable housing that was based off CMHC numbers and how Brantford was amongst the highest in Ontario for affordable housing units. 
That article actually inspired me to join the board of Basic Income Canada as a board member. And I'm very, I was very proud when our province introduced a basic income model here in Brantford. And I was extremely hurt when Doug Ford cut it because we have a need here for affordable housing and, and helping to create the income to support that as a basic need. Um, and it is why also the Trudeau government has created 174,000 units in the last four years. That was under the leadership of Adam Vaughan, who only ran as a liberal candidate in order to make that a reality. During the last um, tenure of the government, I invited him here and he wanted to come back a second time. So he has been here twice. And he took great interest in this riding because we have the most indigenous population in this riding from all over Canada. And he wanted to visit native housing and see how that was being balanced and implement something like that across Canada to alleviate the need for that. We are growing those numbers that Adam has um, built on. We are also investing $15 million a year for veter to help veterans um, who are homeless get the shelter that they need. Uh, and we have a goal to reduce homelessness by 50% within 10 years. So I, the liberal plan is working. We are, more needs to be done and we can't stop making those investments. Overall, we are making other investments into seniors. We increased the OAS uh, amount that you receive by 10%. And we are going to increase that by another 10% once you hit 75. We believe that's because you're going to be spending more money once you retire. And as you get older, your money's going to run out. So that's why we're leaving it 10 years later. Time is up. Thank you. Labor Bell, People's Party of Canada. There is a huge demand for housing, but not just affordable. <laughs> but for other reasons as well, and it is an essential need. It impacts seniors, families, young couples, foreign workers, immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. It takes money to pay for rent, mortgages, utilities to live in a house. The average Canadian is roughly $200 away in each pay for being broke. We need to find a way to put more money in your pocket at the end of every paycheck to afford housing. The People's Party plans to deal with this issue in an indirect fashion. One, we must be able to balance our budget and reduce our debt in the first two years, and that's our commitment. Before we can develop any programs or continue to fund more programs that will establish housing for all people. Two is an income tax reform going from a $7 billion expenditure five-tier tax system to a two-tier tax system, which where an average Canadian family's $55,000 a year income would put $3,500 more a year back in their pockets. This takes care of all the boutique tax credits that you have to pay up front for and then apply for credit later. Eliminate supply management and level the playing field for 90% of the farmers to enjoy and participate in the reindeer games of agriculture for dairy and poultry. That's $400 more a year in your house. Abolishing the capital gains tax so people, businesses can reinvest in alternative housing strategies. Work with other levels of government to streamline legislation and cut out the federal government red tape. We need to free up the, the provinces and the municipalities, the housing industry to build housing that is needed and keep it affordable. And the last one is the ability to address both population growth and the influx requirement of housing. It's a supply management strategy. This is the one that has the most greatest challenge. It will be difficult to balance both. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last Lester Bory, independent. Mr. Bory, I just would like to say that you've been warned. If I hear any more inappropriate comments, you will be asked to leave. Thank you. All right, everyone, if we nationalize our banking system and get rid of the present model that creates more debt than there's money in existence, we can back our currency with labor, and then when we want to build a home, it'll be a positive thing instead of a liability on our bank books, because the people that build the homes will earn their money into existence. And that's what I plan to do. Now, there's another thing we can do as well. You don't just control the issuing of money when you control money, for, like when a nation controls its currency, you also control the debt. 
And for people in homes that have overpaid for their houses because the prices are ridiculous, we can change the amount that you owe. And we can give you debt relief. And then new people can buy houses and they won't be in debt for the rest of their life to the bankers. Like the, uh, the conservatives want to increase the length of mortgages to 30 years. That just puts more money into a banker's pocket. And I'm here because I want to keep your money in your pocket, not in a banker's pocket. And a nationalized bank would run a near zero balance. And the money from lending, when we create money out of thin air the way they do now, when that money doesn't sustain the uh, civil service, then we'll print money to augment the difference. And that's what we'll do. And that's how, uh, I can't mention it because the lady will kick me off the stage, but in history, a country went from having hyperinflation to being an economic superpower. And that's how they did it. So all the scoffers in here might want to just uh, take a second look at that, okay? And that's what happened. There's a proven record in history for a miracle that happened. It was called an economic miracle. And I, I propose we do the same thing here. It has nothing to do with bigotry or racism. It's got to do with money. And that's all it is. All right, guys? I'm a Canadian through and through. Time's up. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Now we'll move on to question two. How will your party balance the pressing climate crisis with the economic needs of the country? First this time is Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition Party. Well, this is where I become very unpopular at this table with many of my candidates. There is no climate crisis, people. Oh, no. Nobody at this table, all the hear me out folks, nobody at this table is going to say climate change doesn't exist. I will. I will too. <laughs> Go figure. Nobody that matters at this table will say that climate no. change... Thank you. I'll take the warning. There's my yellow card. <laughs> climate change exists. It absolutely does. This world's been around for 4.5 billion years. We've been around as people, what, 100,000, 200,000 tops. It has seen more damaging stuff than we could ever do in the 100,000 or 200,000 years we people have got to share this lovely little blue and green ball. We've only been in industrialism for about 200 of those years. It's pretty arrogant of us as a society to think that something so beautiful as, as the planet, we can have that big of effect on. Now, we are poisoning it, but I assure you that the planet will be here long after we have decided to kill ourselves before we kill it. <laughs> now, that being said, there's always more we can do. But again, in today's society, they, they, people want to put stuff on social media to prove they're doing something. They want to not use plastic straws. North America as a whole is only less than 1% of the ocean's pollution. But we want to sit there and say, oh look, I'm doing something by not using a plastic straw. You want to do something about recycling. We go back to what we did when I grew up out west in Calgary. We still had a milk van. Our pop came in glass bottles. We got to return them to the corner stores. Our newspapers got bundled up. We would take them back as well. People claim they want to help the environment as long as it doesn't inconvenience their lives. Thank you. Bob Jonathan, Green Party. Thank you for sticking it out. I appreciate that. How will our party balance the pressing climate crisis with economic needs of the country? The Green Party's 20-point Mission Possible Climate Action Plan does exactly that. First, we have to recognize that we have a climate emergency and create a cross-cabinet, a cross-party uh, cabinet to address the issue. We want to make sure that all the different parties, all the politicians, are working together on this. We have to get and set scientifically determined goals for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. That's a 60% reduction in the next 10 years. We don't have 10 years to get started. We have 10 years to be finished at, to have that accomplished. One way of, of, a proven way of achieving that is to implement a carbon fee and dividend. The carbon fee would be applied to any fossil fuels that are extracted or imported into Canada. And then the dividends would be paid out to the Canadians uh, across the board. 
it ends up that you and I would end up receiving more money as a dividend than we would ever pay in the carbon tax. It's not carbon neutral, but it's revenue neutral because none of that carbon fee goes into uh, uh, the federal coffers. We need to restore the incentives that's been taken away from us provincially. We need to restore the incentives for uh, green infrastructure, for being able to purchase uh, an electric vehicle. We need to be able to uh, switch to clean energy. And by that I mean electricity, not, uh, not natural gas. Right now, uh, we are exporting, Quebec is exporting electricity to the United States at a loss. We need to improve our cost cross Canada electricity grid so that we can actually benefit from the electricity that's already being generated in Quebec. We need to improve mass transit, not Uberized transit, but transit that is actually effective for everybody. Um, and we need to ensure that all our fossil fuel workers are taken care of. Thank you. I'm sorry. Next, Sabrina Sawyer, New Democratic Party. We need to fight this climate crisis like we actually want to win. Climate change is putting everything we value at risk. We are looking at adopting a science-based GHG emissions reduction targets for 2030. They're in line with stabilizing the global temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We know that Mr. Trudeau likes to give his lovely speeches about climate change. The hypo hypocrisy, though, is real. He declares a climate emergency and then the next day buys a pipeline for $4.5 billion. Not just any pipeline, but a 65-year-old pipeline that can't continue to be used, but is going to have to be completely rebuilt, which takes another investment of 13 to $14 billion. Notwithstanding the $1 billion in handouts to the big oil companies. We're looking at eliminating fossil fuel subsidies immediately and getting Canada powered by net carbon free electricity by 2030, creating 300,000 jobs, investing in clean energy product projects with a climate bank, investing massively in and electrifying transit, re retrofitting homes across the country and putting more zero emissions vehicles on the road. And that's immediately. That's not waiting 10 years. That's not waiting 25 years. That's taking action immediately. Thank you. Dave Lovell, People's Party of Canada. I believe we all agree that climate is forever changing. And depending on your faith or your science, climate change has been happening for tens of thousands and billions of years. Our planet has experienced one to five ice ages depending on the science you follow. Every ice age includes a global warming and a global cooling. But how do we differ? By the means of how we react. We can shout and scream and create alarmism with climate crisis and emerging emergencies and impending doom. The government will come along and tax us with carbon tax CO2. That's the air we breathe. Or we can change our attitudes, continue to lead by example, and be the very best stewards and caretaker of our land, water, and air. And how does the People's Party of Canada proceed to do this? One, stop sending billions of dollars to other countries for their CO2 emissions. Focus on home. Abolish the carbon tax now, not in 2022, according to the conservative tax credit policy posts. <coughs> Withdraw from the Paris Accord and set our own national, provincial standards and expectations. Encourage provincial governments to implement programs to reduce emissions. Put the onus on smaller government to work with municipalities to get the job done. Implement practical solutions to make Canada's air, water and soil cleaner and encourage all levels of government to work collectively to monitor and address industries and organizations who, for example, dump billions of liters of toxic waste in our water systems. And also, let us phase out our subsidies for green technology towards the end. Get government out of the way of private industry and let them lead our cleaning of environment by their expertise. Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party of Canada has the right plan and it's a common sense approach to a long-term solution. Thank you. Thank you. John Trudeau, Independent. 
Smartestman.ca slash global warming has my 88 line poem on global warming. About 20 years ago, how many people remember hearing about the pause, the hiatus? What was that? Well, in 1998, don't forget before that, CO2 and temperature were both spiking. And in 1998, oh, temperature paused, stopped going up, but CO2 kept spiking. And then in 2009, Climate Gate comes out, and we find out that Michael Mann and the boys used the trick to hide the decline, which they call the pause in Rise. But it was a decline. So here is a hockey stick graph that you were fed, and notice back here, it's supposed to keep going up, but there was a pause. How long is the pause? When did it stop? It ain't stopped yet. 21 years. So little Greta at the UN screaming the sky's on fire, she never had a rise in her whole life because it's colder now than 98 and I win every argument by saying I'll bet you 20 bucks it's colder this year than 98 and every expert runs away from a $20 bet because that wins it. So, but this is the real graph you weren't told about. There was something called the medieval warming period 800 years ago when Greenland was green and you could go grapes in Breton. And Michael Mann's statistical massage made the medieval warm period disappear and make you people think that this is dangerous. Okay? You've been lied to, you've been tricked, and all these people remain tricked by, sorry, fooled by the trick to hide the decline. Okay? I'm a scientist. I object to them playing with the numbers to come up with the wrong answers. You don't understand? Fine. I do. I'll bet my money this year is colder than 98. So who's scared anymore? I'm not. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Plus angry. Glory. The biggest scam in history. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm puzzled. Well, most people here seem to think there's a climate crisis. I'm not even here to argue that. Uh, basically regarding carbon. But it seems like most people here want to keep bringing a huge amount of people into Canada that produce carbon. So what's it going to be? Is there a climate crisis or what? Or if people say that we should reduce carbon by reducing our population, reducing the size of it, now we're bigots. So what's it going to be? You don't want solutions? Or do you want to admit that maybe there's no problem? Because if there's a problem, we wouldn't be bringing a million people here a year. Costing us $40 billion a year, okay? $40 billion. That's a lot of health care. That's a lot of civil services that we could buy. Right? A lot of people can do some work for us and service at our old age. I'm getting older. My bones aren't the best anymore. All right? Now, if you want to fight pollution, I'm on your team. I'm your guy. Because if we nationalize the banks and we print our money and back it with, interest, with uh, labor, whatever we need to clean up, we can clean it up. You know, you've heard the statements before. We don't have the money to do this the right way. We have to, you know, live in, live in pollution. No, you don't have to. Whatever you want to do, you can create. Your imagination is your limit. All the money in the world will be there for us to earn into existence, not just give away. That will be for seniors because they earned it over their lifetime. 40000 a year is what I plan on giving them. All right? And they don't care how they get their money, whether I print it or whatever happens, as long as seniors get their, current, their, get their money. All right? And as far as I'm concerned, they've backed it with their uh, loyalty to Canada over all these years. All right? So printing money is the interest to fix the environment. It's the... It's the uh, it's the uh, solution for health care. It's the solution for homelessness. It's the solution for a lot of things, all right? And if we keep picking these up, uh, or say the parties that I'm running against here, isn't that the definition of insanity? To vote or pick the same thing over and over, expecting a different result? Danielle, thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Danielle Takas, Liberal Party. Thank you. We did buy a pipeline, but it wasn't a bad deal. Number one, we bought it because Stephen Harper made certain commitments that we had to adhere to as a government. And number two, here's the benefits that come from that. The, I talked to union workers here who wanted us to take pride in that because they believe that by us believing that that pipeline works is us trusting that they are good union workers and they can get the job done and we've trained them well. The money that 
from the sale of that pipeline, it's going to be invested back into green technologies. So that is the balanced approach to it. We're not going to stop using oil or fossil fuels in the foreseeable future. And I would rather it go through a pipeline that is built by Canadian workers than by other means that have proven to be not safe for the environment and more risk to us. Rail or on the road for transportation that could have detrimental effects and cost lives. This also shows a respect for the law by our government, and it also shows that by the, the amount of times that we're going back to consult, a duty to consult, over 100 Indigenous groups have signed on to support that and will benefit from that as well. And we are working with all of them to ensure that there can be a deal for everyone there on the table. We are putting a price on carbon. And I believe most people here support that. And you should be receiving a tax rebate that more than compensates for that. Andrew Scheer does not take climate change seriously. His 65-page plan was panned by environmentalists. It was an oil baron's dream plan. We have Stephen Gilbo on our team and a world-renowned environmental activist because he believes Justin Trudeau is on the right way to make sure that we meet our targets and our world leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to question three. Is your party committed to the establishment of a national pharmacare program? If yes, how does your party plan to implement this commitment? First is John Tremell, independent. Well, I know those people who want handouts will be disappointed. I want to give you a credit card, make you buy it, and then pay it back. Without any interest. Affordable. Like in the old days, before Pierre shut down the interest-free loans and started our national debt growing and debts two trillion taxed since Pierre helped banks us fleece. Reversing the algorithm gets back 60 grand a piece. So every one of us who was working in 1974, we were all taxed 60,000 bucks each for debt service because Trudeau stopped using interest-free money. How do you feel knowing 60 G's over your life was stolen from you and you deserved it because you believe that interest fights inflation, remember that? Raising costs will lower prices. Remember that? Hey, you're the people who believe that you saw planes doing 500 miles an hour at sea level on 911. You believe an aluminum plane cut through a steel building like a roadrunner cutter. You believe two no. plane loads of gasoline can melt st three steel buildings. So, of course, I'm trying to tell you that you've been lied to so much and you haven't done your homework and bad times are coming. So yes, if you get an interest-free credit card, you can afford your medication and you can afford your doctors like in the old days. Before you needed charity. Thank you. Leslie Boring, independent. I've been talking about, I've been speaking about a, a pharma care program since I began running for office ten years ago. Uh, I'm not a wealthy individual, and I don't think I'll ever be one, uh, the way things are going in our country. I miss them on the ground with all the people. And I know what it's like to be sick, and uh, I took an injury a little while ago, and I saw how a similar injury, I snapped my Achilles tendon on the right side. A few, 20 years ago, I did the left side. Things since then have slid in our healthcare system. I got sewed up on the left side. I got therapy for free. And everything's fine. The right side, all they do is put you in a boot and angle your toe down, and you don't get any free therapy, and it broke again. I broke it twice, all right? So I know what the healthcare system is, and I hear stories from other people that are far worse than mine. If you back your currency with labor, then you can uh, print money to uh, pay for the pills and uh, give her whatever drugs people need. And I recommend nationalizing these pharmacies or these uh, pharmaceutical companies so that we don't get fentanyl on the streets from these guys. We'll be able to control it a lot better. I'm pretty sure that's where this stuff's coming from, all right? So I think that we should uh, take things in hand in our nation and nationalize our healthcare system and provide a one-payer one system for doctors. They can be like entrepreneurs, I don't care, but we'll have a, 
a system that pays for it. It'll be back with the labor of the doctors themselves. When you guys get a loan these days and it's printed out of thin air, what goes to pay the money back? Eh, your labor efforts, don't it? No matter where it comes from, that's where, it, that's where your, uh, the money comes from to cover the loan that you got, all right? So that's just one of the myths that you've heard over the years is you can't do this. And the people that uh, hire the bankers or hire the newspaper people are the bankers. So they're giving us information that we develop our opinions with, all right? So if we're lied to, garbage in, garbage out, you vote for the wrong people, it's over. Do it all over again, repeat, all right? And that's why I'm here, to stand up for Canadians and to make sure that we're not left behind in our old age. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you. Dave Ravel, People's Party of Canada. It's always a hard act to follow. <laughs> Healthcare, including pharmacare, is an exclusive provincial jurisdiction. It is written into the Canadian Constitution that allows the provinces to manage that part of our lives. That said, do I agree with pharmacare? Yes. However, if we're going to step into that foray, Let's make sure that we are able to do it financially. The PPC say, let's start with a balanced budget and deficit and do it in two years. At that point, we can start looking at how we create the funding to the provinces and territories to do these types of programs. How do we get funding? The People's Party of Canada says, let's replace the current Canadian health care transfer payments with a permanent transfer system by reallocating the GST portion back to each of the individual provinces. That is money that they have immediately without having to wait for federal transfer payments. We also need to establish a temporary program to compensate provinces and territories where those types of arrangements give them less money than the money that they would currently receive under a federal transfer. Also, let us create conditions for provincial and territorial governments to innovate. They have the skill set and they have the mandate under the Constitution. They will be fully responsible for health care and pharma care and fully accountable to you and you and you and every citizen across this country based on province and territory. We need to make sure that the federal government stops meddling in provincial legislated matters. The choice is clear and the People's Party take a responsible approach to letting the provincial governments and the territorial governments do their job in accordance with the amended, with legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Junkman, Green Party. Is our party committed to establishing a pharma care program? Yes. And how do we plan to implement that? Well, the Green Party has been proposing a national pharma care program since well before the 2015 election. When people have financial access to their medicines, the cost of health care actually goes down. And I'm not entirely sure of this, but I believe that the cost of health care will go down in proportion to the cost of, uh, of the pharma care program itself. So a large portion of that would end up being self-funding. But our uh, uh, platform budget identifies $30 billion a year to implement the National Pharma Care Program, uh, as well as an additional $2 billion a year for dental care. Uh, the money comes from overhauling the tax system. The tax system needs overhaul. It hasn't been uh, overhauled in, I think, uh, 40 or 50 years. Um, but there's enough money to, to pay for this. As I mentioned before, through uh, closing tax loopholes, through um, ensuring that companies that do business in Canada actually pay tax in Canada. I'm thinking the Netflix, the Googles, the, uh, the Facebooks. And Mr. Robel was right. Healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction, but there is a national um, healthcare act, as well as um, federal provincial accords, health accords, which um, determine how each province is going to, to deal with their healthcare. So another um, issue that can be resolved by the Council of Canadian um, Governments, where they can work together to establish national pharmacare, a national health care act, and having a national health care act would prevent 
provinces from having desperately different healthcare standards and would prevent provinces from cutting healthcare uh, as a whim in an effort to possibly save money. Healthcare should not be dependent on a single government's whim. It's your health that's important, and the Green Party will ensure that healthcare is standard across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle Tavris, Liberal Party. I have been talking a lot about our pharmacare plan at the doors, and a common response I get, especially from seniors as well, I already don't pay for it, it's covered under the coverage I have, so this doesn't really affect me, I just pay the dispensing fee, which is a couple dollars. And let me tell you why, though, it's important to have a nationalized plan. Doug Ford decides that one day something that you currently is that you currently get that's covered is cut. A nationalized farm care plan will ensure that that doesn't happen. And $53 billion in cuts again, that was just announced from the Conservatives, where is that going to come from? It's a big number. I'm going to bet some of it's going to come from what's currently given towards the provinces for health care funding. So we are dedicated to working with all the provinces um, and giving and creating an $11 billion <coughs> accord to create pharmacare. This is not a new idea. I don't care what party it comes from, we are committed to making it happen. We are going to create a drug agency to negotiate Costco style rates and purchase them for across the board for Canada. <coughs> and also, we are going to ensure that every Canadian has access to a family doctor or a healthcare team. I asked my doctor at Shellington Place, what is a family health care team and is that less than a do getting a doctor? She informed me that they already have those models in place that if you call and say I have a certain issue that you get that doctor that specializes in that issue or that your, child, your file is shared amongst that team that is there. So, farmer care plan, yes we are committed to it. We are committed to making this happen. In addition to creating, in addition to the $11 billion, a fresh $6 billion um, health care fund to make those things that I just discussed happen, such as the doctor access and um, increasing mental health support as well. Thank you. The Democratic Party. Canada is the only country in the world with uni universal health care that doesn't cover medication. And we have that universal health care because of the NDP and their commitment to do so. Tommy Douglas brought that for us. The Liberals have promised pharmacare before in 1993. It's 2019. We still don't have it. We are absolutely committed to a full single-payer pharmacare plan. We are looking at... Um, providing those supports for all, for all people. So when we're looking at small businesses that are providing those insurance, this is saving for all. It's not just those that are covered, not covered, but for all people. So this is gonna help those small businesses that we have in our county that are employing and running those programs, and that's really important. It's gonna cover students that fall in that gap between parents and own after they graduate when they're no longer covered under their insurance and they're seeking it on their own. It's going to cover them, and that's my son right now looking for that. And yes, absolutely, we, we look at the programs that have been cut, and we do need to be afraid of that. We absolutely do, and that's why we are absolutely committed to providing that pharmacare. We want to make sure that that's happening by the end of 2020. This isn't 10 years down the road, this is now. So as soon as government comes in within one year, we will have that pharmacare in place. And that's absolutely something I'm proud to stand behind Jeff Mead saying for. Thank you. Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition In a perfect world, pharmacare for all would be absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, as we found out last June, with OHIP Plus, for anyone that remembers that, that was an absolute train wreck. And that is because the people involved did not do the legwork and put in the research. <clears throat> We've already witnessed what happens to the casinos, alcohol, tobacco, and now recreational marijuana. What happens when the government owns a monopoly on something? <clears throat> we the people always get charged way more money and receive way less than advertised. So no, at this point in time, the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada would not support Pharmacare for All. 
However, what we would support, absolutely, 100% medication covered to children under the age of 18 years old like we used to have. We would also drastically, drastically reduce the cost of medications to senior citizens that still have their livable and financial independence, offer free medical assistance 100% to senior citizens that are in long-term long care, and of course, to our veterans. Again, we've seen what happens when a government owns a monopoly on something, and it's something we cannot afford to do again. Thank you. I have one more question that you didn't receive, and you will all have one minute for your ideas. What is your party's strategy for helping Canadians adjust in the transition to expanding automation of work? Starting with Bob Johnson, please, Green Party. In my real job, I'm a computer consultant. So I have been working very hard to automate all kinds of work. And the Green Party has an answer to that. It's the guaranteed livable income, so that everyone would receive an income sufficient to live on and let the robots do all the hard work. It means that people would be able to uh, make art, they'd be able to make music, they'd be able to write books and, and sing songs without having to work that day job. So automation is actually a reasonably good thing as long as there is support to be able to um, give people to, to live off a livable income. Thank you. Danielle Takis, Liberal Party. Do you want me to read it again? Yes? What is your party's strategy for helping Canadians adjust in the transition to expanding automation of work? <coughs> So I just want to also give a hat tip right now to the GM plant in Oshawa. They have committed um, to funding the education of about 1,400 people um, who want to be reskilled in um, a new trade or field. And that is their, I guess, party gift. I know they've um, said not all jobs now are gonna be lost, but that's their commitment in order to rebuild um, the economy that we're going into that they, the, the reality is that they're facing is uh, losing us. So we need more companies like that who commit to doing partnerships like that. We've also invested a lot in AI uh, clusters and KW is one of them. There's about four of them across Canada that Navi Baines has announced and that is providing the skills necessary in order for people to adapt and work in those environments and those are mil multi, multi-million dollar investments. Time's up, thank you. Thank you. Sabrina Sawyer, the Democratic Party. So when we're looking at the transition of workers, when we're looking at the climate change, we're investing 300,000 uh, jobs in that so that we can support those working workers making the transition. We're also looking at changes to EI, so workers that are looking to change, um, change workforces that they're able to engage in training. They're able to engage in those supports necessary to make those changes because we're seeing that every day. Our workforce is changing. When we look at those families from 30 to 50, there's a lot of change happening and they need those supports mm -hmm. and the NDP is absolutely committing those, committed to those families to supporting them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John Jamel, Independent. <clears throat> Well, I'm going back to the days of social credit. The founder was an engineer, Clifford Scott Douglas, and uh, he said that as the lever of technology gets longer and longer, it's gonna take less and less human labor to produce everything. What are we gonna do? He said, the wage should be replaced by a dividend on your share of the plantation's robot production. Now, if you work in a restaurant, you still get that paycheck. But you should get a dividend, not charity, not a basic income, your share, your dividend of the robot production. And therefore, I don't fear robot production as long as I get a share of the robot paychecks. Thank you. Leslie Gorey, Independent. If immigration outpaces job creation, we're doomed, all right? No matter what I say. 
Immigration will always outpace any effort I make to employ people. We have to consider that. Now, if we print our money without interest and back it with labor, eventually people's bank accounts will grow fat, people will be able to own their own homes, people won't have to pay property taxes. And we can have more immigrants! <laughs> we can have, Please, Mr. Yeah. Tuesday. Sorry. It's, quite, it's a possibility, yeah. it really is. Hey, the more the merrier rebellion, it's more fun to share with others, eh? <laughs> I don't mind more people, just as long as we can afford it. All right, so when people don't have to go to work and they own their own homes, like my dad used to say, when the horses aren't hungry, you don't have to feed them. All right, we used to try and pay off our machines in our machine shop. And then it's just profit after that. Then people can relax if we can divide the work week up a little bit more, have a shorter work week and share the labor. All right, but right now, if we keep going down the road, we're going to go One on. One minute's up. We're on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition Party. Well, you know what they say, you cannot stop progress no matter what. But something I've learned in my two years as president of Local 467 of the American Federation of Musicians, I've learned that it's always best to say, let me get back to you than to talk out of your rear end. So on this question, let me get back to you on this one. Dave Rebell, People's Party. People's Party has no specific policy. So I'm gonna take this in a little different direction. We watch as technology changes. We watch as construction in, um, in the construction industry changes. I've been a product of that change. I've had to go back and retrain. There are programs through EI that allow that to take place. There are those who are injured and work WSIB retraining programs. There are already components that are there. But we also need to, and I teach this with my students and share this, there's a thought of wisdom. We need to start preparing because we already know this is happening. We know that there is a risk. It's called continuing education. It's about reaching out and gathering a little bit further beyond our grasp. Who does this really well right now? The millennials, because they see the change and the availability of, and downgrading of workforce. They become creative and they find their jobs and they create their own industries. That's the balance we have to take. The onus actually is not on the employer. It becomes part of us as individuals planning for our futures. Thank you. Thank you. So, I have some questions that were submitted from the audience. And uh, the first one, these are all one minute, please. And this person feels we should make guns illegal. What will your party do about this? People's Party of Canada already has uh, policy in place uh, that they will represent. It's changes in the uh, gun legislation. Guns will not be illegal. However, there will be changes in the way training is done, the way that the guns are handled and stored. There will be issues with regards to uh, how long you have your licensing. There will be changes in the types of firearms that you are allowed to possess. But making them illegal will not happen under the PPC government. Thank you. Yeah. Sabrina Sawyer, NDP. The NDP are committed to more strict gun on when we're looking at certain types of ammunition, certain types of firearms. We don't need rapid fire in the city. And we are also supporting local communities, looking at what they need for the restrictions for their communities. What works for Toronto and Vancouver may not be what works for Paris and Brantford. So we are open to communities making those decisions themselves, but also with stricter around our high, our high power rapid firearms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Independent. Our gun laws are fine the way they are. What we have to do is we have to take the commodity off the street called drugs that people are fighting over. You don't see guys at gun raisers shooting each other up because they're not selling drugs. Take the guns off the street. Now, we buy our handguns and our, and our guns just for uh, just a little bit of fun, you know? But if anything happened, we might have to back up our military. And I think they'd like a, a bunch of Canadians that were fairly well armed to back them up. And that's what I think. I don't think we need to take people's guns away. And the next thing, you know, maybe we'll lose all of our freedoms. It's a hard thing to predict, right? That's what I'm against. So I don't think we need to step on people's toes and take away more of their rights. It's bad enough that we aren't even allowed to speak freely anymore. 
All right, we might want to get that right back before we start looking at taking other rights away. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Junkman. Green. The uh, Green Party would eliminate um, automatic and semi-automatic weapons, except for police and military use, and would uh, allow handguns only for sport use, for uh, police and military use as well. Um, but there would be no accessibility to automated or semi-automatic weapons for the general public. Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition Party. The Veterans Coalition Party of Canada, as you all probably uh, predicted, we do recognize the rights for Canadian citizens to have gun ownership. We do, however, will increase stiffer gun laws. If you are caught committing a crime with a gun of any kind, whether it's a semi-automatic weapon or a rifle, any gun violence whatsoever, and you will prepare to do long-term, long time. It's now we're the middle. Uh, Danielle Takas, Liberal Party. We are committed to banning assault weapons and working with municipalities who choose to ban assault um, hand to ban handguns. Eight crimes in Brantford thus far, and it's not even the end of October. This is not Toronto, folks. Um, Brantford is having a gun problem, and we need to have uh, make sure that this does not happen. At the rural debate, our MP, our current MP, incumbent and conservative candidate said you should have a right to defend yourself. I do not believe in ask questions later. I do not believe we are living in the United States. Um, murder is murder, and we need laws to protect ourselves, and we still need laws to protect our property. But those laws are in place for a reason. The police are there for a reason. 911 is there for a reason. And we have to empower our police forces to make sure they can have the ability to respond in an adequate manner. And our justice system must also be strong in order to be a deterrent so that people know that handguns and violence are not acceptable in our community. Next question. One minute each. John oh, sorry, John. I beg your pardon. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Trumell. Yes. Sorry about that. Now, I spent two years in the military, so I had my share of rifles and machine guns and bazookas. And I like living in a country where 99% of the people don't have guns except for the cops and the robbers. Right? We're pretty lucky compared to the states. But how do we solve their problem to solve ours? How can we make people want to give up their guns? Stop them from being scared. Now, down in the States, for instance, they want guns because someone's going to mug you for your iPhone or your sneakers. But what happens when every thug and drunk and addict has an interest free credit card so he doesn't need to mug you anymore? Right? And someday we hope he gets straight and pays it back. But with no interest, it's not like we're going to have to write off much. So, this, I believe that I don't mind guns being out there, but I would like to induce people to not need them around the house. And if every time some daddy's kid blows himself up, we'll be able to point at that daddy and say, hey, fluoride, aspartame, glyphosate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. What have you done or what, your, what would your party do to increase women's involvement in politics or the business world? <laughs> What have you done or would your party do to increase women's involvement in politics or the business world? First, Dave Robel, People's Party, please. This is perfect because I believe in absolute equality. I love to see women in skilled trades. I've dealt with this for 16 years. I encourage women to be involved, period. They can do the job just as effectively as any man. In fact, in most cases, with the attention to detail, do a job better than men. And I use architectural engineering as a fine example. Some of the best students are women. If you want to be involved in something, find the passion, get involved. You have it within you to do it. We support it, and I definitely support it. Thank you. I have 
Let's see, I'm the only, to start, I'm the only woman at the government relations table to represent um, the banks in Ottawa. People said the first day I started, do I have to treat you differently? I said, no, you don't. Just maybe once a month. <laughs> and um, I am dedicated, a woman got me involved in politics. I am dedicated to being the second woman representative for brand for brand and being an advocate for other girls who come up with me and bring me their homemade signs and say I want to be you because you are showing me what I want that you are showing me that this is possible Trudeau has been a feminist government he has put every piece of legislation has to go through a feminist lens child care, child care as well yes we are promoting child care out there and putting record number of spaces out there and it's something we have been committed for decades we are committed to making sure that um, about 300,000 new spots are created in the coming years ahead and help flex workers. If you work shift work or um, irregular hours, that happens. The Women's Entrepreneur Fund, 1.4 billion Thank into you. women. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition. Well, this one's an absolute no-brainer. The Veterans Coalition Party of Canada is all over this 100% because it's a proven fact now. Times, times have changed. Women are now way more educated, way more driven than, than men are nowadays. I have a 23-year-old son, and I watch him, and let me tell you, he is nowhere near as motivated as his girlfriend is. <laughs> I guess somebody's got to work nowadays with the millennials, right? So absolutely, 100%. There, there is no battle of the sexes anymore. Women truly are exactly the same as men, only with different body parts. So 100%, they, they deserve to be on every level of politics and in the workforce. Thank you. Bob Johnson, Green Party. In countries that have proportional representation, there is far greater gender balance in their governments. Proportional representation doesn't only mean uh, proportionality for the parties, it also means proportionality for gender balance, for uh, religious affiliation, for ethnic origin, for all manner of, of other things that aren't well represented in our parliament today. So the Green Party would absolutely implement proportional representation, and as a result, we will see more women being elected to parliament. As far as business goes, I'm glad somebody mentioned childcare because that had actually slipped my mind. The uh, Green Party does have $15 a day uh, childcare uh, in its platform, so uh, that uh, would go some ways to um, encouraging women to rejoin the workforce after um, work. The other thing is uh, the guaranteed livable income. The only people who stay out of work with a guaranteed livable income are women who look after their children, students staying in school, and men who are looking for work in their field of training. So having a guaranteed livable income would give women the opportunity to work from home because they've got the guaranteed livable income to live off. Thank you. Thank you. Lesson Laurie, Thanks for the question. Uh, I'm a machinist, which is, uh, you see a lot of guys in machine shops, you don't see a whole lot of ladies. Uh, we had one lady work with me uh, recently or in my shop and I took her under my wing when I could and so did all the other guys. And whenever we had a special operation that comes up once in a while, like a special kind of cut or something, I asked her to come over to witness it. That way she could see how it's done. All right? I treat her like she was my own daughter my son. All right? She's a younger lady. Uh, it wasn't for her. She left on her own, but we tried to do what we could do while she was there. The shop I work in has some of the most skilled people anywhere. All right, I don't see the difference between men and women when it comes to work. All right, it's not like I'm looking for a spouse or something like that. You know what I mean? But other than that, we're all the same. And just gotta throw out the welcome mat and let women know that they're welcome and wanted. Because if we need something made in Canada, I don't care who makes it. If I need something. The fact that I've got it is all I care about, all right? I don't care where it came from. It's always made in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sabrina Sawyer, NDP. So when it comes to how do I engage women to get more involved in politics or business, that is what I do. Within my union, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, I'm involved at every single level, working with leadership programs, encouraging women, speaking at a number of women's programs, Leaders for Tomorrow. When we look at the FNMI Leadership Symposium, I've spoken every year for the last four years. 
Locally, I'm involved in our local union. I tap other women on the shoulder. I've created two leadership programs within the school board. One called Leaders for Tomorrow, which focus on marginalized students, and another called the Goodway Club to encourage indigenous student leadership. And primarily those are attended by young girls, hopefully getting them into student politics and then moving on from that. So women in leadership, that is what I do and that is what I am. Thank you. Well, as a professional poker player, I have played opposite some smart, tough, competent women who would be insulted at the thought that they should get some kind of a leg up when they compete with me, even on the Great White Shark, the Taj Professor at the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. I was called a professor in that movie. <laughs> anyway, the point is, I'll give women the same interest-free credit card I'll give men and nothing else. If they can't make it on their own, they're losers. If they can, they're winners, just like my poker game. So why should I treat women differently elsewhere? Thank you. Leaders of political parties, when found in violation of conflict of interest standards, receive nothing more than nominal fines. Does your party believe there should be real, meaningful consequences for such violations? <laughs> October 21st, we are going to the polls. You have a choice to make. And you can assess whether things were done um, for, to protect jobs or if somebody else was playing political games. I don't believe any party is different from another party. Politics is about getting work done. And you want somebody who's going to fight for you and bring jobs to this community. And that is what I'm going to do starting from day one if I am elected as your representative. Thank you. John Jamel, dependent. Sure. Criminals should be punished accordingly and not just with a token fine. Sure. Thank you. Anybody disagree? <laughs> Bob Johnman, Green Party. Short answer, yes. Um, in the Green Party, the uh, leader of the party, Elizabeth May, is no different from any other member of the party. She's a spokesperson for the party, uh, articulates the policy, does so very well, but doesn't establish policy, doesn't uh, instruct the members, doesn't uh, direct um, votes in Parliament. She's not the party whip. Um, and so she, our leader, is exactly like anyone else uh, within the party. And if there's a conflict of interest uh, case to be resolved, um, Elizabeth May should be treated just as any other member of the political sphere. Thank you. Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition. Absolutely, 100%. And the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada actually took a step further. Every candidate across Canada that we have has signed a memorandum of understanding that says that if we do not at least attempt to fulfill everything in our platform, each candidate in each writing will voluntarily resign. I would like to see the other parties do that as well. Dave yeah. Bell. Politicians should never be exempt from the rule of law. And that includes conflicts of interest, that includes any obstructions of justice in investigations. Fines aren't enough. We are there, we are elected with your trust. And when we violate that trust, just like if you did this in your daily lives, you would find fines, criminal charges, potential removal from your job. And quite frankly, I look at it as first offense, depending on the offense, fines. Censure of your office, an expulsion from politics. Not a problem for me. I've represented it that way as a member of council. You are held accountable. And it should be every four years. Because I have to say, that is the lamest excuse I've ever heard come out of anyone's mouth. Oh, we'll get ready in four years. No, you break the law, you're gone. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Pastor Gordy, it would depend on the uh, nature of the offense. Like, for instance, if, uh, say, somebody like, say, Stephen Harper allowed the communist Chinese to buy oil fields in Canada, I'd say that's a death penalty offense. Or like, or like Trudeau's dad, 
We're letting the bankers take over our financial system, I'd say that'd be a death penalty. You're deep into death penalty territory on that one. Or if you fight wars for other countries, okay. then that's Tore a problem down a with bit, me. Please. What? Just tone it down a little bit. It's a bit harsh. <laughs> That's what we need to do to discourage this kind of treason, I would think, eh? All right, this is, uh, this is for control of our nation, these meetings right here in this election, okay? We've got to provide people with some kind of consequences to consider if they're going to betray us. So people like me who are representing the Canadian people need to be hurt, all right? And I don't mind uh, getting tough with these people who are betraying us. Your lifestyle suck because of the people that have betrayed us, and that's the bottom line. Thank you very much. Sabrina Sawyer, New Democratic Party, please. So I am so honored to work with a leader like Jagmeet Singh, who absolutely leads with integrity. And we have to ask ourselves, how many ethics violations are too many? Fines are absolutely not enough. At what point do we say no more? We have in the NDP some of the strongest vetting process and it took us that long to get our candidates together because we believe in the people that we put forward and we expect the integrity that comes with it. And I'm absolutely proud to run for a party that does that. And I believe in Jagmeet and the integrity that he's going to bring to our Prime Minister's office. Thank you. Next question. How does your party intend to improve cybersecurity and privacy protection laws? I think that uh, information shouldn't be gleaned by private corporations. I think that's the job of a security service. And it shouldn't be a, a broad brush that sweeps the nation. You know, you pick who you want to spy on, and you spy on those few people if they're uh, making you a little suspicious about what they're doing. Other than that, right now, we've got a, a system that's looking over all our shoulders, no matter who we are. And they're going to do things to us if they don't like what we say. All right, Bill Blair already said if, we're, uh, if we uh, dislike certain people or something like that, they're going to take our firearms away. All right, and I'm not into that kind of thing. I like freedom. I grew up in the Cold War. What we're living right now is what we're fighting against in the Cold War. And this communism is just all over the place right now. It's a mess. And we need to clean it up with some nationalism, my friends. We'll live better and we'll be more secure. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle Takas, liberal. I need to um, applaud Karina Gould, the Minister of Democratic um, institutions because she has done a great job in a limited amount of time in order to bring more transparency even to this election. Um, do you know when you share an advertisement on Facebook that once you share it and even if you see it being promoted, that once it's shared it's seen as organic content so that your friends don't know that it's an advertisement. So we're taking rules to combat that. We're taking rules to combat influence in our democracy to we make sure that things that happen in the United States don't happen here. We also took a lot of rules that took effect in this election about fundraising and transparency for third parties to make sure you knew exactly where your money was going and how you were being influenced. I encourage you all to check out who targets me to see how you're being targeted and by whom in this election. I work in the banking sector. Cybersecurity is number one for us because it is our reputation, and I'm happy as your MP to bring that experience in the banking sector to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Table Bell. Party. Thank you very much. I think there's always room for improvement on national laws. Uh, we have uh, very secure. I'm going to say that we have very strong legislation in place for financial institutions and um, insurance industries. What I'm suggesting is that we take it one step further to third-party providers, such as um, Google, such as Facebook, where they are limited in what they can and cannot do here on Canadian soil and Canadian content. I think those are steps we need to look at as a government. This is not just a single-party issue. This is a put your parties aside and work together collectively because it's a national security measure that needs to be put in place. Bipartisan will win the day for this particular type of policy and approach. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. John Turnell, independent. Well, I have nothing to hide, so I don't care. 
What do I care who knows about me? What do I care who has my information? What can they do with it that's going to bother me? I don't know. Why are you upset that big corporations know stuff about you? So what if they know that I got sore feet and suddenly I see more ads for art supports? You know? I don't know, but I don't care. It's not dangerous. Now, considering that the media hypnotizes you, that's a different story. To make you believe all sorts of funny stuff. 911 stuff, raising costs, lowers prices. There's a lot of stuff you've been tricked into believing that your grandchildren are going to laugh at. But most of them are going to be sick because of the aspartame and the fluoride and the glyphosate you gave them or let your politicians give them. So, you did it. You're responsible for the state of the next generation. And I'm only saying, boy, time's we can up. afford better. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Jeff Gallagher, Veterans Coalition. <laughs> Luckily for me, I'm part of a party that is built by veterans. So you can be rest assured that they will take cybersecurity just as passionately as they did when they actually were standing on the battlefields. This one was a no-brainer. I was not a tech guy whatsoever. I know that might shock y'all right now. <laughs> I know, big surprise, my son had to teach me how to use a phone, but I had to teach him how to use a spoon. But no, <laughs> that's, that's where we have the advantage as the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada. We've already dedicated our lives to the security and protection of this country. Cybersecurity will not be a joke to these veterans. Thank you. Sabrina Sawyer, so the new Democrats recognize the threats posed by interference in Canadian elections, and they're committed to doing more to make sure that it isn't happening here. We're also committed to strengthen privacy protections for Canadians by boosting the power of the Privacy Commissioner, commissioner to make and enforce those orders. And Bob Johnson, Green Party. The stack actually said that uh, Doreen Gould has been working on uh, Canadian cybersecurity. That's the right idea. Um, electoral security uh, is, is exceptionally important. And right now, Canadian federal elections are being done the right way. It's being done with a paper ballot, which is about as secure as you could get. Back in, what, 1870 or so, Australia adopted the secret paper ballot. That was a huge technological advance that has really not been improved on since. Uh, Elections Canada does an absolutely marvelous job in dealing with the paper and in an absolutely secure manner. There are problems with cybersecurity uh, in the surveillance corporations, the, uh, the Googles, the Facebooks. Um, the Green Party has a platform stance on that, but as a computer consultant, I somewhat disagree with that. Uh, having internet service providers provide censorship on what the larger companies can do is the wrong way to go about improving cybersecurity. Mr. Orwell said something about this not being a single party issue. It's not a single country issue. It has an international problem that needs to be addressed Thanks. internationally. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll end the questions there. And I will ask each of you to have a, make a closing statement of one minute long. One minute, Jeff Gallagher, starting Veterans Coalition. I'm sure everyone has a lot to digest tonight and uh, think about the entertainment factor as well. So. <laughs> There's so much to process today, I'm not going to bore anybody with a recap. I'm going to say this, though. You've sat here, you've heard the sales pitch from everybody involved. On Monday, October 21st, the choice is up to you. If there's anything I hadn't said that you figure was so far extreme, I invite everybody to check out the Veterans Coalition Party of Canada.com. I also have copies up here tonight of our full platform. And outside of that, I am no stranger to miracles, and I truly believe that anything worth fighting for and anything you love, you're going to do it. I truly love the citizens of Brantford Brant, and I'm fighting for them, and I'm fighting for every Canadian veteran that feels this country has turned their backs on them. My name is Jeffrey Gallagher, and we still stand on guard for thee. Thank you. This time I want to back up the table, so Dave Rebell's next. People's Party. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for your patience and your tolerance. 
to the ladies and organizers, organizers here this evening. Thank you very much for all the effort that you have fundamentally made here for us to make it a much more comfortable and much more of a learning-based environment. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dave Robel. I am the candidate for the Coalition's Party. We can talk about who I am and what I've done and all these wonderful accomplishments, but that's not the issue. The issue here is we have choices. The issue here is we have the ability to separate ourselves from the status quo, to break with tradition. I encourage everyone to use that incredible dollar, and I'm not talking about the dollar that's in your wallet. I'm talking about that dollar, your vote. You worked hard for it for four years to cast it once. Take the time to explore each party's policies. Make an informed decision. And if you want change, change comes with the ability of getting uncomfortable. I'm challenging you, ladies and gentlemen, get uncomfortable and make that vote. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New Democratic Party. I absolutely agree, we need to get uncomfortable. People are going to ask you to vote strategically, and we've been doing this for decades and decades, and we are still seeing the same broken promises time and time again, and we are ready for change, we're ready for leadership. In this time of divisive politics, we're seeing it right here at this table, and we need leaders that are willing to take that on. We know that the Conservatives bring an austerity budget. We know that the Liberals fall in that, like, that line as well. We know that during the last provincial election, the Liberals ended up siding with the government uh, that we now have in place with Ford. And is that what we want this time? They're going to flip over to the other side? That's not who we are. NDP? Absolutely. The Liberals sided with the, the Conservatives and the provincial government. We don't need that here. We have a choice. Vote for your values. Don't vote out of fear. Vote for the NDP. Thank you. Danielle Tarkus, Liberal Party. Um, I think tonight it's only appropriate to thank Mr. Gallagher and any veterans here tonight for their service, so I would like to acknowledge and thank you for that. Um, as you prepare to vote next Monday, I would like to ask you two questions. Do you value stability in so social programs and the economy? Or are you somehow prepared to absorb $53 billion in painful cuts proposed by Andrew Scheer and Phil McCullman? The bottom line is Brand for Brand deserves an MP that will move our community forward, who values your feedback no matter who you are or where you live. <coughs> I know how to work together to take action and get things done, and I know this community. We need a progressive MP who is going to stop Doug Ford and Andrew Scheer from teaming up to attack those programs that we value. If you're a liberal or not, if you value strong climate change, indigenous reconciliation, a feminist government, action on affordable housing, and a growing economy that's lifting people out of poverty and working, I'm asking you to cast your vote. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. How many people know family and friends who committed suicide because of their dire, miserable poverty? Probably everybody. The point was, your families, your kids, they're all going to be under the same yoke of oppression. And someday, they're going to ask you, when you had the chance, to give me an interest-free credit card so I wouldn't have to be broke all the time. Hey, put it on the tombstone, okay? Right, dead people committing suicide out of poverty. Put it on your tombstone. Anyway, Brent One did a video of me it's not at their site, they didn't put it up. The others are all up, but I'm not. But I got a big copy and I posted it. So just YouTube for Brent One and Spark Move if you want to hear what I have to say. You just heard a few snippets tonight. But Brent One did a great interview, so good it was too hot for them to put it up. Okay? So look for Brent One and Spark Thank Move you. and you'll find my story. Thank you. Leslie Dory, Independent. Well, I think by now you figured out that if something needs saying, I'll be saying it. And if it's to advocate for all you, I'll be saying it. I won't just cut and run like some people do at the first sign of trouble, all right? I'm here to fight for you, not to be a little whip and run away, instead of fighting it out for the rest of the night, all right? All right, folks, if you want someone to stand up to the most powerful enemies of our nation and their stooges in the House of Commons, 
You pick me, and I'll do that very thing. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Bob Johnson. Green Party. This has been an ugly election campaign. The media is concentrating on all the insults, jabs, and words that the leaders are throwing at each other. Although here in, in Bradford Branch, we've been very polite towards each other at any rate. Um, the Green Party values cooperation and consensus-based uh, decision-making above partisan politics. So if there should be a minority government, the Green Party and I would be willing to work with any other party to achieve results. As long as the three priorities for the Green Party are met, which is addressing the climate change in a main, uh, meaningful way, having reconciliation with indigenous peoples, and having electoral reform. Don't vote strategically, vote for what you believe in. Vote for the things that you actually want. Because if you vote for something you don't want, the best thing that can happen is that you're not going to get it. The Green Party is the only party with a realistic, science-based climate action plan. So if you really do want to have a, a change in, in government, vote for Green, vote for me, I'm Bob Johnson.